Shalyn was, you know, she was 22 and she was in school full time to become an RN. She had been recovering from a torn ACL in her leg. She had had an MRI done before she left, knowing that she was transitioning jobs. She drove 20 plus hours to get over on that leg injury. It wasn't severe at that point. But when she arrived, she kept on saying, look at my leg, mom, and all the time. Look, it's a different color and it's swollen. And when I left, I got a phone call from her. She was playing around and then she had fallen on that same leg. For her to be in as much pain as she was in, that was like, okay, yeah, just, we need to go to the hospital. They were asking her for her insurance. Shalyn had mistakenly replied no when they asked her if she had it. I'll never forget the tone of her voice when she called me. She's like, mommy, I'm begging them for something for this pain. It hurts so bad. And I'm begging them for some testing to see what's wrong. I asked them for an MRI and they told me I need to go get insurance and see a specialist because they're not a doctor's office. They failed to notice that there was a blood clot. I think it was a week or two weeks later, she had to fly back to Kansas City. And you know, when you get into a plane, the cabin pressure, causes, you know, can cause a blood clot to dislodge. And it went into her lungs and caused a massive pulmonary embolism. She had a clot so massive that it was from her ankle up to her groin. <laughs> when the time came, I got up into bed with her. I was there with her when she took her first breath. And I was gonna be with her when she took the, her last. And as she died, I whispered to her, I love you so much. And I promise you, you will not have died in vain. I had made attempts to contact the hospital. No one was really interested in, in speaking. And pretty much it was, we gave the best service for Shalyn. We did everything that we're supposed to do. One of the things that really struck out to me as I was searching um, for reasons why Shalyn died, I ran across studies after studies of the discrepancies and outcomes for black and brown women versus white women. As, as a medical community, there needs to be a lot more attention to these discrepancies, that she had all of these things that made her higher risk for a blood clot were not taken into an account. She was black, she had sickle cell trait, she had PCOS, she was on birth control, she was overweight, and she had a red swollen leg. She had all these symptoms, she didn't, they didn't check for a blood clot, and instead of them doing the necessary test required, they did what is called a wallet biopsy. And they essentially sent my daughter to her death. How would you feel if it was you, that's the guiding principle you should be thinking about. How do you change going forward? We all know that companies have mitigated risk and risk assessment. We need to stop thinking of it that way. And especially healthcare facilities. These are people's lives. I would say treat your patients like they're your family. Treat it as if you were in that situation to where you would lose your sister, your daughter, or your mother. Don't discriminate towards people. If they're saying they need help, help them like you're supposed to. If you go into the medical field, you should have that passion to help save people, live up to that passion and save everyone no matter what, and treat them as if they were your family. How would you want your family or your loved one to be treated? So not only is it the, the moral thing to do, but from a business standpoint, I think you're absolutely nuts if you're not reaching out to patients and trying to better what's happening in your facility and stopping the needless deaths. Not stopping it down by a percent, but to none. To none. The sad thing is that when I got Shalyn's phone after she died, I was looking through what she had been doing. And because she had been so embarrassed and so demoralized, instead of going to a hospital immediately, as she had been told she needed to get insurance, she was looking up signs of a heart attack hours before she called an ambulance. 
hours. As we just saw from Shailene's story, not only did she not receive immediate attention due to the color of her skin, disparity in care happened because the hospital wasn't sure how it would be paid by insurance. Let's talk more about disparities in healthcare. Growing up in rural, uh, segregated uh, Alabama in an area called the Black Belt. So when I, what I saw there and what I still see all these years later is at the time I did not know was disparity. And that disparity uh, I would describe as this indifference. And W.E.B. DuBose described it as a peculiar indifference. And that indifference continues to persist, it is pervasive, uh, and it is stubborn. Uh, the result of, of, of this indifference are, are significant, uh, less than optimal and poor outcomes for black, indigenous, and other people of color uh, in the United States, and in fact, around the world. And this is uh, quantifiable. Uh, it comes back to us through qualitative measures such as surveys and opinion surveys and the patient experience uh, that we see in healthcare today. So when we think about these disparities then, these differences uh, for specific populations, primarily these marginalized populations, we see this in surgical procedures, surgical outcomes, decisions being made about medical treatment and medical interventions. We see it expressed in the harm that's caused both in outpatient and specifically inpatient setting as it relates to hospital-acquired infections uh, and other hospital-acquired conditions, such as falls with injury and pressure ulcer. We also see the same disparities in long-term care facilities. Uh, and there are other marginalized and vulnerable populations where disparities also are present. This is in disabled populations, uh, people who are in the rural areas that are poor, uh, people who have um, some other kind of, of cognitive disability, people who are obese, uh, we see it uh, in the LGBTQ plus population as well. One of the issues that we really need to take on if we're ever going to achieve health equity and uh, eliminate disparities is take a, a honest, courageous look at structural and institutional bias uh, and racism that has been part and parcel of healthcare delivery and clinical decision making far too long. This goes back to the early 1600s when black people first uh, came to the U.S. Uh, as slaves uh, from, from Africa. And it continues to this day. Uh, so then as we begin to uh, have these frank and honest conversations about what are the structures, what are the policies in place that continue to support uh, a system that is currently designed uh, to create disparities and, and create the pain and anguish uh, that many of our patients see, particularly in the black indigenous and people of color populations and again, other marginalized populations. So then as a uh, care provider, what I would say is I have to find ways to be a better service to, to all patients, not just the ones that are insured, not just the ones that are white or high income or, or et cetera. So in order to do that, what I would advocate for uh, is that patients begin to take charge of their health care that they in fact become part of an abolitionist movement, if I may call it that, so that we begin to address disparities and abolish disparities and abolish inequities, begin to undo uh, deep-seated institutional and structural uh, biases uh, that have existed for too long. In order to do that, uh, we, we have to engage with the patients uh, and say, you have to be more active in, in your healthcare uh, and, and enter into those partnerships to co-produce that, if I may call it equity in healthcare. A big part of this for patients is we, and I'm a patient, learn to communicate, to take charge of our health and our healthcare. Uh, communicate, ask questions, seek more knowledge about your healthcare. Uh, uh, begin to break down these paternalistic barriers that have existed for far too long in healthcare settings and, and almost the, the passive acceptance by marginalized communi communities and populations as it relates to their health care. Uh, so in order to do that then, that there, we have to form relationships. Uh, uh, people that we care for uh, need to 
work on building a trusting relationship with clinical providers, clinical decision makers, uh, and, and truly uh, reach new levels of, of, of activation that we haven't seen to date. I'm very hopeful that we're having these conversations. I'm very hopeful that we can begin to at least make more progress uh, in issues around health disparity and health care disparity, and, and then start to achieve uh, health equity that we so so desperately need uh, in health care, not just here in the U.S., but uh, globally. African-American mistrust of health care is real. It's a real thing. And what the larger society has to understand is it's well-rooted. There were so many things going on, not just the Tuskegee experiment. There were forced non-consensual sterilizations. My own grandmother, my mom's mother, was an unknowing participant in a radiation experiment that took place at a hospital in Cincinnati from 1960 to 1972. My grandmother died when my mother was 15. It was devastating to their family. And these kinds of stories are pervasive across the country with black people. And so there is a history there, not just the Tuskegee experiment, but other things that took place in healthcare that make African-Americans not trust the system. And then when you go into a hospital today and have some of the experiences that I had, nurses asking, how can your parents afford to be here? Or people bringing garbage to my dad. And then when we talk to the nurse manager, they say, well, we don't get many blacks here. When you have that kind of flippant behavior, when you have that kind of um, offensiveness, it's easy to understand why blacks don't trust health care. So we've got to repair that trust. We've got to build a bridge and be better. We've got to start looking at health care and the way we treat patients of color. In a pandemic, unfortunately, minorities suffer disproportionately. Recent statistics show that Blacks had 2.6 more times the risk of dying after contracted COVID-19. In New York City as well, Black people make up 22% of the population, but accounted for 28% of COVID-19 deaths. And similar trends can be seen among Hispanic and Latino populations at national and state levels. A pandemic unveils our different realities. Everybody should take COVID-19 seriously. And by this, I do not mean living in fear but we should be properly informed about common symptoms and recognize that some people have a high risk of progressing to a condition where hospitalization might be needed, especially people above the age of 60 and those who suffer diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. Unfortunately, again, these chronic conditions are far more common in certain minorities. It is a responsibility to help spread the message of prevention in all our communities. As physicians, we strive to save and improve lives, but we can also do so by avoiding errors, by creating a safe and transparent environment in the hospital. This is a big change of paradigm. I believe that preventing errors is a condition that can cause more than 250,000 deaths per year in the United States. And this condition should be studied rigorously and above all, we should act together with full transparency. I am proud to represent this movement that has the potential to improve our lives immensely. Unite for Safe Care represents to me hope, health, and happiness. If you're a person of color and you're a patient in the hospital, there are a couple of things I feel like you should really hold as central. You need to hold with both generosity and clarity that racial bias in the healthcare system is a thing. And so that mean, when I say generosity and clarity, what I mean by that is generosity toward the human beings behind the system that are struggling. And when I say clarity, I mean, even though you hold the humanity of the people and you treat them like human beings first, I'm talking about doctors, nurses, et cetera, just be clear that racial bias is a thing and you're gonna need to advocate for yourself. 
So advocate for yourself. Do it early and do it often and don't make any assumptions. When it comes to disparities in the healthcare system right now, especially due to COVID, I have a personal stake in this because I'm pregnant right now, but black maternal health is really on my mind. I've just read so many stories about black mamas who are not getting access to the kind of testing that they need because there's so many barriers that so many people have anyway about going to the doctor. But in the era of a pandemic, when you're getting constant messages from the hospital to do as many appointments via video as you can, you don't have someone touching your belly to figure out how big your uterus is. Maybe you're not going in for frequent blood tests. Maybe doctors are missing things. And many of the women, the black women who have died in childbirth in this era of COVID was because they missed these vital tests. So one recommendation that I would have around this is I would love to see hospitals doing more outdoor care, especially in this era of COVID. If we know that being indoors, I didn't go to the hospital as much as I needed to this pregnancy because I didn't want to be inside. I didn't want to be stuck inside of a hospital room with an N95 mask, just shaking and praying that I didn't get infected. But there are certain tests that can be done outside. What would it look like for a phlebotomist station to be set up outdoors? That is something that feels very important to me. Patients of color, I would say, need to make sure that they're going to credible sources to be informed in regards to COVID-19. And with that, I would also ask people to be responsible in using social media. Social media is a great platform, but you have to know when to use it. And social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter should not be your end all and be all for your source of information, especially as it pertains to the medical points of this pandemic. I think if you're trying to find credible information, you want to rely on credible sources and that are based in the science and medical facts. And you can find good resources from the CDC website. You can find good information at Chicago.gov. There's a subsection on that website. Uh, that specifically talks about COVID-19, as well as the Illinois Department of Health website. So those are good sources that you can rely on for credible information. Also, this is a, a small, more medically related fact. Um, people of color tend to be more vitamin D deficient. So we all think about vitamin D as it relates to our bones, but vitamin D also has a, an immune protective effect. And a lot of people of color uh, particularly African Americans tend to be vitamin D deficient. So because we've seen that in treating patients with coronavirus that vitamin D has a positive effect, I would urge people to be more knowledgeable about their own vitamin D status and if you're deficient or low that you want to make sure that you're keeping up your vitamin D through your diet and possibly with supplementation. As a Native American woman, I have a very special message. Um, health issues in our reservations, in our communities, are, are we don't have much due to poverty, due to lack of facilities uh, on the reservations. It's very sad with what's going on with the COVID. Per capita, the rates of death and infection are higher than the population in general in the United States, and I have special words that you please understand what is going on. We're talking about people who do not have running water, gas, or electricity. 40% of the reservations lack those basic rights. Uh, we are trying to fight for those things, but people do not pay attention to us very often. So again, this is very important for Native people. I'm addressing you personally. Please learn you have rights, and please use those rights and speak up. Hello, everyone. My name is Styx, rapper slash activist, and I'm coming to you live from Think Watts headquarters right here in Watts, California. When it comes to bringing new messages to the world, I'm all about it. And today, I want to talk about the patient safety movement and the Unite for Safe Care campaign. It's all about bringing awareness for medical errors. And did you know that medical errors are the third leading cause of death today in America. 
And did you also know that the black and brown community have rates of infection and medical errors higher than any other background and culture? The disparity between the two cultures is insurmountable. Creator, grandfather, grandmother, I offer this prayer, a very short prayer for the world to hear. I'm asking for blessings for all people who are ill at this time, who are suffering in some way, Creator. I ask this in a good way. I ask for our spirits and our ancestors to surround us and give us good energy and to be healthy and to have good food, clean water, and all the things that we need for life that are simple, nothing more, food, and good health, Creator. I ask for all caretakers that they realize these are human beings to always treat them with kindness, especially during this pandemic. Uh, I see many frontline workers, they put in hours and hours of work and they're the last person to hold that person who is passing their hand. Their family is not allowed to be with them and it's such a hard time. So Creator, these are my special prayers and I ask it this for in a good way. Aho, Neshu Nachama.